And the jury is out on whether it is a deliberate distraction from the pressing concerns of Australians about the economy, inflation and the cost of living, or simply proof of Labor being captured. But we've had another week of Parliament where the proposal to amend Australia's constitution to insert a so-called voice to Parliament took centre stage. This week, the opposition honed in on the scope of the matters over which the voice would have a say. And it quickly became clear that Indigenous Affairs Minister Linda Burney either isn't across her brief or is prepared to mislead about the role this body would actually play. Check this out. Would the voice be able to make representations to the Chief of the Defence Force on military acquisitions or the location or operation of military bases? I can tell you what the voice will not be giving advice on. It won't be giving advice on parking tickets. It won't be giving, giving advice on, a, on tra changing Australia Day. Order. Members on it my left. It will not be giving advice on, uh, on all, of this, uh, all of the ridiculous things that this side has come up with. First, she didn't answer the question about military influence. But also, no one has suggested the voice would deal with parking tickets, or at least that I've seen, and I've been following it pretty closely. To trivialise and mock those people who raise sincere concerns about matters ranging from environmental policy to project approvals and reparations is to treat mainstream Australians like they're idiots. And that's always an unwise political move. But did you hear what she said about Australia Day? Well, on that, she's either plain wrong or providing yet more proof that there is so much uncertainty surrounding the scope, role and purpose of this voice that it would be madness to put it in the Constitution. When he spoke about the proposal for constitutional change in Parliament, Attorney General Mark Dreyfus made it clear that the primary function of the voice was to make representation, quote, about matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but he added this part as well and matters relevant to the Australian community, including general laws or measures, but which affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples differently to other members of the Australian community. Those words, general laws and measures, well, that means it's so broad as to include most policy areas of law and policy, provided they touch on the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. But on any common sense view, the date of Australia Day has to fall within that scope. Now, there's a cohort of Indigenous people who experience it differently, in that they perceive January 26 as Invasion Day and lobby for the date of Australia Day to be changed. It's not a view I share, but we can't deny there's a cohort of people who are concerned about that. But for Minister Burney to suggest that Australia Day could not come within the remit of the voice either shows an ignorance of her brief or a government that's prepared to say one thing to Aboriginal activists and another to mainstream Australia. Well, we can't trust a government that tells the activists, activists that the voice will be the panacea while telling everyone else it won't change a thing. So where can we look for a clearer picture of what the voice is intended to do? Well, thanks to Fair Australia, we have learned that the lead advocate on the Yes campaign, CFMMEU official Thomas Mayo, has been pretty frank about the objects of its design. He's called for, quote, the abolition of colonial institutions. Presumably that also includes our democracy. He has been willing to acknowledge with thanks that, quote, our communist elders have been an important part of our struggle. I know you comrades that are listening today um, will continue to support our struggle um, and you are an important part of the struggle, just like commun our communist elders have been an important part of our struggle. And Mr Mayo has been upfront about the way that The Voice will, quote, punish politicians who ignore its advice, such as forcing Australians to, quote, pay the rent with, again, quote, reparations and compensation. 
You know, this is the first step. It's a vital step. Pay the rent, for example. You know, how how do we do that in a way that is transparent and that it actually sees reparations and compensation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? The power in the voice is that it creates the ability for First Nations to go forth with um, coherent. Um, positions on what legislation needs to be created, what legislation needs to be amended, and punish politicians that ignore our advice. And this is breaking news I have for you tonight. Mr Mayo has been recorded conveying a very different approach to the scope of The Voice from that which Minister Burney would suggest. Listen to this chat he had with Teal MP Zoe Daniel. So then sort of bringing this conversation back to 26th of January, on issues like that, if we had the statement from the heart and the, an Indigenous voice to Parliament, do you think that would help sort of synthesise that argument and bring people together in order to move us forward mm. on those sorts of things as a community. Oh, but we could genuinely say to Australia, this is the First Nations, you know, this is the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander position on what 26 January means to us and what we think the solution is, whether it's about, you know, anything else that we debate, all sorts of policy issues and, and not just obviously Indigenous policy issues, but things that might affect us indirectly sort of, you know, like um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's superannuation is a good example. Did you hear that? I hope you heard it right. Mr Mayo, lead advocate on the Yes campaign and instrumental in the design of The Voice, expects it to get its hands on superannuation policy, your retirement funds. The bloke who designed The Voice, who has been selling it around the country, who stands next to the PM as he makes announcements about it and who leads the yes case, he wants a practical veto on super policy. Because, remember, Mr Albanese said it would be a brave government that didn't do as The Voice says. i got to tell you, that's not democracy. So it's time for the government to come clean. How much power will The Voice have over your retirement savings? And if retirement savings are covered, what about other private property rights, savings, investments? It's Fair Australia that's picked this up. Credit to them. And now Teal MPs like Zoe Daniel, as well as Labor, have a lot of explaining to do. Well, Mr Mayo is right about this. If any of those predictions are correct, it will, to use his words, be, quote, a black political force to be reckoned with. But it would also be divisive, oppressive and open to abuse. And that's not good for anyone, whatever the colour of their skin may be. Before I bring in Senator Jacinta Nampajimpa-Price to discuss this, I thought it would be helpful to mention the opinion that was provided by a well-known barrister named David F. Jackson of King's Council. He's arguably Australia's most well-known and capable constitutional law barrister. Very sadly, he passed away recently. In his opinion, which was submitted to the committee that looked at this before Parliament, he observes that constitutional change to establish a voice to Parliament is wholly unnecessary because the Parliament already has the power to legislate for a voice to Parliament if that's what's needed to turn around the fortunes of Indigenous Australians. He says, the first observation I would make is that in light of the Parliament's existing legislative powers, and then he quotes the sections, that the proposed chapter seems quite unnecessary. He also says... The short fact is that there is no reason at all why the Parliament cannot legislate to establish a body now which has features similar to those proposed for the voice in the proposed section 129. If that's the case, what is the point of a referendum to insert a further legislative power in the Constitution? Can I tell you, that's a really significant opinion. It means that all of the claims that Linda Burney and others make, that the constitutional change is needed to improve the lot of Aboriginal Australians, 
are actually false. Because even if you think a voice to parliament body is a good thing, you don't need to change the constitution to get it. And if the government were prepared to offer a modest recognition in the preamble of the constitution, it would have bipartisan support and, I'd suggest, the majority of Australian support. 